Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hunters. All right, we're starting in with episode two of the witness statements today. And we have Harrington and Doherty. I am going to butcher these names. That's no way around that. They will be butchered. Okay, so Thursday, August 4th, 1892. I'm assuming that this means the timestamp, perhaps, of when he was writing it down, when the officer was writing a statement down. So 1135, Harrington and Doherty, Thursday, August 4th, 1892, 1135. At this hour, I, with Frank Wixon, entered the Borden House, 92 Second Street. Dr. Bowen met me at the kitchen door and said, I'm glad to see you. I inquired, what is the trouble? He said, Mr. Borden is dead. I went into the next room and there found the remains on his sofa covered with a sheet. In low tones, the doctor told me he was satisfied that there was something wrong for they were all sick the day before. He followed this by saying, to make matters worse, Mrs. Borden is lying dead upstairs. I suppose she saw the killing of her husband and run upstairs and died with fright. It continually amazes me that people assume that she just up and died with fright. And now apparently Mrs. Borden is part of a slasher movie. Well, I guess she was with the hatchet involved, but even more so of a modern day slasher movie where she ran upstairs when seeing the killer. And instead of being killed, she died with fright. I requested to see her and on going upstairs found her lying on the floor face downward between the bed and dressing case. Several spots of blood was on the bed and also a large tuft of hair. On examining the body, I found she was lying in a pool of blood. I informed the doctor of this fact and he expressed much surprise. I requested the doctor, Mr. Wixon and reporter to remain by the bodies until I notified the marshal. Is anyone else wondering where the reporter came from? I don't remember him in the last witness statements. It's been a few days, but I don't see him in my notes either. Unless the man that the first officer encountered was not an officer, like I assumed, but was in fact a reporter. So he didn't actually say he was an officer. The doctor had said, are one of you an officer? And he's like, hey, that guy's an officer. So I suppose the other guy could have been a reporter. The doctor stated the deed was committed by an ax, cleaver, or some such instrument. The servant girl said she let Mr. Borden in the front door at 1050. With another officer, I made a hurried search of the house from attic to cellar and found no trace of any strange person or weapon. Lizzie said she was in the barn and said, no, I did not hear any noise, whatever. The working girl said she was upstairs and heard no noise until Miss Lizzie called her. Miss Lizzie had no suspicions on the farmhands. E. H. Doherty in the morning. Although Lizzie did not see the man who called about the store, still she did not explain how she knew it was he who called the second time. That is just kind of an aside note from the officer who's making the statement saying that, Hey, I asked her about this. And her response was, I never saw the guy, I... but she doesn't say then how she knows it's the same guy. I'm assuming since she's relating the conversation, she heard his voice. Thursday, August 4th, 1892, Miss Lizzie saw father when he returned from the post office. He sat down to read the paper. I went out to the barn, remained 20 minutes, returned, and found him dead. Saw no one in the yard when going to or returning from the barn. Heard no noise, whatever, while in the barn. Not even in the opening and closing of the screen door. Why not? You were but a short distance and would have heard the noise so made. I was upstairs in the loft. What motive? I don't know. Was it robbery? I think not, for everything appears all right, even to the watch in father's pocket and ring on his finger. Have you any reason, no matter how slight, to suspect anybody? 
No, I have not. Why hesitate? Well, a few weeks ago, father had angry words with a man about something. What was it? I did not know at the time, but they were both very angry at the time, and the stranger went away. Did you see him at all? No, sir. They were in another room, but from the tone of their voices, I knew things were not pleasant between them. Did your father say anything about him or his visit? Uh, no, sir. About two weeks ago, he called again. They had a very animated conversation during which they got very angry again. I heard father say, no, sir, I will not let my store for any such business. Just before they separated, I heard father say, well, when you are in town again, come up and I will let you know about it. During this conversation with Lizzie, I cautioned her about what she might say at the present time. I said, owing to the atrociousness of the crime, perhaps you are not in a mental condition to give as clear a statement of the facts as you will be tomorrow. And also by that time, you may be able to tell more about the man who wished to hire the store. You may recollect having heard his name or of seeing him or thereby be enabled to give a description of him or may recollect of something said about him by your father. So I say it may be better for you not to submit to an interview until tomorrow, when you may be better able to recite what you know the circumstances. To this, she replied, No, I think I can tell you all I know now, just as well as any other time. This conversation took place in Lizzie's room on the second floor, in the presence of Miss Alice Russell, who sat in a chair by the door which leads to the front hall, by which I entered Lizzie's room. Miss Russell was very pale and much agitated, which she showed by her short, sharp breathing and wringing her hands. She spoke not a word. Lizzie stood by the foot of the bed and talked in the most calm and collected manner. Her whole bearing was the most remarkable under the circumstances. There was not the least indication of agitation, no sign of sorrow or grief, no lamentation of the heart, no comment on the horror of the crime and no expression of a wish that the criminal be caught all this and something that to me is indescribable gave birth to a thought that was most revolting i thought at least she knew more than she wished to tell i arrived at the house at 12 15 or 12 20. the conversation with lizzie was about five minutes later she was dressed in a striped house wrapper, full waist and caught on the side by a bright red ribbon, which was tied in a bow in front. The stripes were on the pink shade, and between them was a dark figure. After leaving her, I went down to the kitchen. Where was Dr. Bowen, Assistant Fleet, Dr. Dolan, Bridget, and several others? Dr. Bowen had scraps of paper in his hand, on which there was some writing. He and I spoke about them and he tried to put some of them together. And he said, it is nothing. It is something about, I think my daughter going through somewhere. If I recall correctly, it was addressed to Emma and about that. I am not sure. The doctor then said, it does not amount to anything. And taking the lid off of the kitchen stove, he dropped the pieces in. There was very little fire in the stove and the ashes which were on top looked as though paper had been burned there. Just weird to me. I mean, they're supposed to be there for a murder, but he finds a letter addressed to his daughter in the house that the murder was committed. And it's all torn up. And his response is, oh, it's nothing. This is nothing whatsoever. Um, I'm just going to toss this on in the kitchen fire. Don't pay me any attention. Everybody else is in the room. It's definitely not evidence of anything and is definitely not incriminating against my poor, poor, precious daughter. The more I'm reading this, even though we're only on day two, the more I'm like, wow, this whole thing is sus. Like everybody is knowing exactly what time they're doing things like how how many of us are down to, to the five minutes like this maybe it's, maybe it's just me 
maybe I'm the only one who is has no idea how much time has passed. I have a clock on my monitor and still have no idea what time has passed. About this time, someone said something about milk. I looked in the direction from which the voice came and saw Dr. Dolan standing at the table. He called to me and said, Phil, I want you to take care of this milk. The family has been sick and I don't want you to leave it until I relieve you. In a few minutes, Mr. Fleet gave orders to several of the officers to cover the several roads leading out of town. Divine and Garvey he sent, to, sent on Stratford Road and I was ordered to cover Bay Street. I told him about Dr. Dolan's orders to me in regard to the milk. He replied, yes, I heard him when he spoke to you, but I will take care of the milk and you go down the lower road. I spoke to him about the Ferry Street Depot and he said, that is covered. So now it looks like they're canvassing pretty much the city, maybe the neighborhood. Um, I didn't look too much at the Sanborn maps to figure this out, but they're at least canvassing the area looking for, I guess, blood covered suspects. Because I'm assuming if you were had your face smashed in with a hatchet, that whoever did the smashing would be covered in blood. When at the foot of William Street, I saw two suspicious characters and brought them to the station. Later, when the marshal had a talk with them, he ordered them locked up. Officer Leonard and I had a call to the NB Savings Bank, where we found a Portuguese who was drawing out his full deposit of 60 odd dollars. He could speak English but poorly, so we brought him to the station. Officer Leonard went for an interpreter, and the suspect, giving a satisfactory account of himself, was allowed to go. I am assuming the only reason this man was a suspect was because he was foreign. I mean, so we have a foreigner who is withdrawing his entire deposit. I'm also assuming, not knowing the rates of inflation, that $60 was a lot of money. I don't even like spending $60 on a pair of shoes. So yeah, I'm going to go with $60 was a hell of a lot of money between uh, 1892 and now. I can't even imagine what the inflation is. I might look that up later, but not right now. I then went to the Borden barn where Marshall gave orders to several officers to search the barn thoroughly and took part in the work downstairs. It was at this time I made my suspicions of Ms. Lizzie. To the Marshall, I said, I don't like that girl. He said, what is that? I repeated and further said, under the circumstances, she does not act in a manner to suit me. It is strange to say the least. When we finished the first floor of the barn, we ascended to the loft and Marshall going just ahead of me. There I found officers Connors, Doherty, and Jay Riley. The Marshall said, I want you men to go give this place complete going over. Every nook and corner must be looked into, and this hay turned over. I then said to him, If any girl can show you or me or anybody else what can interest her up here for 20 minutes, I would like to have her do it. The marshal shook his head and said something about it being incredible. His words I cannot give. He assisted in the search for some minutes and then went downstairs. I remained until we were satisfied our duty was done. Uh, yeah, let's just be frank here for a minute. I don't care if it is 1892. You and I can both think of quite a few things a woman can do upstairs in a loft, either by herself or with one or more other people for 20 minutes. These things would have been beyond scandalous at this time. And we would not even blink. After this, went to the cellar of the house. On entering the washing room, lying on the floor were two axes and one hatchet. There, with another, which was then missing, I had previously seen upstairs, I think in the hand of Dr. Dolan. Immediately, I went in search of the missing hatchet and found it in the first cellar. I gave it to assistant fleet and suggested placing it someplace where it could not be readily found. This he did. The cellar was thoroughly searched by Assistant Marshal Fleet, Dr. Dolan, and one or two others, whom at present I cannot recall, but think they were officers J. Riley, Unmullily, and myself. 
After this, with several others, I assisted in the search of the yard. This being completed, the marshal directed Officer Doherty and myself to take all the yards on 3rd Street, south of Dr. Conan's. Nothing was found in either yard. At Dr. Conan's house, we found his assistant, but he was at Bowenville during the forenoon, and the doctor and family were at Paul Tuck at Rhode Island, leaving there about five in the morning. When the doctor's assistant was on his way to Bowenville, he called at Dr. Colet's and requested Colet's son to go and care for the house. He was busy at the drugstore and could not go, so the assistant went off. Afterward, Dr. Colet's daughter, Lucy, was sent up to Dr. Conan's to await callers. She could not gain entrance, for the door was locked. So she remained in the yard from 9.45 or thereabouts till noon when the assistant returned. She is positive no one could go through the yard without being seen by her. She heard no noise. The next yard contains a barn and is occupied by John Crow, a mason and builder. On the day in question, John Denny, a stone cutter, employed by Dr. Crow, was working in there all day. He is positive no one went through the yard. There were other men drawing stone in the yard all day, and they saw nothing of a suspicious character. Patrick McGowan is the man who was eating pears on the pile of lumber and said to have been on the fence. He is employed by Mr. Crow and left the yard about 10. The next house is occupied by Mrs. Crapo, and she and the girl were at home all Thursday, August 4th but heard no noise. Neither did they see any person go through their yard. The Fall River Ice Company is next south, and in this yard there are several men constantly employed. We saw them, and they reported nobody came their way. In the morning, shortly before the murder, Dr. Kelly's girl, Mary, was talking to Bridget over the fence. Neither saw anyone in or around the yard. On this morning, Mrs. Dr. Bowen was sitting at her front window, which is directly opposite the Borden yard, and in full view of both front and side doors, awaiting and watching for the coming of her daughter. She was at this window until 10.55. The daughter was away and was expected on the forenoon train. At this point, Mrs. Bowen arose and said, well, she will not come now. Mrs. Churchill left her house about 11 and returned between 11.15 and 11.20. While away, her mother, Mrs. Buffington, was in the dining room off the kitchen, wheeling to and fro a baby carriage, which contained a sick baby. Although the windows were open, she heard no noise. Mrs. John Gomley was in her room at number 92nd Street, Window open, heard no noise, and saw no one. At 11.15, Dennis Sullivan, employed at Allen and Slade's, came along and stopped to talk to Mrs. Gomely. While going up 2nd Street, he saw no person leave the yard or go up or down the street whom he could place suspicion. Thursday night after supper, went to investigate the rumor of a suspicious character, who was hanging around the Upper Second Ridge, Whipple, Cottage, and Middle Streets. While out on this, we learned of the poison story, which is related below. On this and the succeeding night, we continued an investigation of all drug stores in the city, but could learn nothing further of Lizzie inquiring from any person other than Eli Bentz. Eli Bentz had a lady ask for prussic acid on Wednesday morning, August 3rd. When asked for what use, she said, to put on the edge of a sealskin coat. I made no sale. She left the store in a very haughty manner. No, I do not know her, but I think I would know her again should I see her. After being placed in a position where he could both see and hear Miss Lizzie Borden, he was very positive in identification not only of her face and general appearance, but also of her voice. 
Now, my trial hunters, you guys have probably seen enough trials or read about enough trials to know that identifying suspects is a very tricky business. The human mind is incredibly fallible. So all they have to do is, even on accident, show you, say, a lineup and say like, hey, doesn't number three you look kind of sus? He could have been the person, right? And then all of a sudden, it's definitely that person. Or maybe in this case, you know, they're like, hey, down the street, you know, there's that Borden murder. She wouldn't have happened to have been buying, trying to buy poison, would she? And it's like, yeah, that incredibly makes sense. And that is exactly what happened. But it's not like in 1892 that they had a bunch of security cameras to help with that. So, I mean, all you had to go on was very sus memory. Many sales had been made and a number of persons refused. A description of those who were refused was obtained, but none resembled the person who called on Bents. However, at P.S. Brown's a day or two before, a lady requested a sale of poison from Clerk Gifford. She was refused. He could give no description of her. We were on guard at the house from one in the morning until nine Friday. At one, the house was all in darkness and so remained all night. There was no noise until about 6.20. About 6.30, Mr. John Morse came to the side door and said, Good morning, and spoke about the weather. At 8.30, he came out and going over to S.H. Miller's, he called Bridget, who stayed there that night. He then went to the post office, stopped about a minute, and went out and crossed to George E. Howe's, where he purchased a two-cent stamp. He then returned to the post office, and at 8.32 dropped a letter addressed to William A. Davis, South Dartmouth. It bore the words, In haste. On his way home, he tried the daily news door, and it was not open. Saturday morning, August 6th, A. Allen Morse, employed by Covell and Osborne, had to be located on that day, Thursday. His whereabouts were satisfactory. Henry M. Carter, number 88 Snell Street, had a dispute with Mr. Borden about rent and water bill. On this day, he was engaged, serving a kneading breakfast up to 10 at Mr. Garvey's number 10 Cross Street. At 11, he took the train at Ferry Street for Stone Bridge. He has a paper credit from A.J. Borden for $66 for rent dated August 1st. Monday, August 8, 1892, Thomas A. Matherson, number 12, Brunel Street, reported Charles Baldwin as saying he could put his hand on the murderer. Baldwin was seen at Smith & Wood's tea store. He denied saying so and said he knew nothing whatever of the case. Matherson and Baldwin are each given to talk, and so placed very little confidence in what he said. We also know Baldwin has this reputation. This is a problem with receiving tips. People are going to give tips that either incriminate someone or maybe clear someone. It, it happens now, too. Tip lines are notorious for being flooded. That's often why the police withhold key information so they can set up the AI to filter out the good tips from the bad tips. Even that's not perfect because sometimes a good tip may not have the keywords that the AI is set up for. Saturday, August 6, 1892. Mrs. John Gromley, number 92nd Street. Please fix the time. About 11 o'clock, I could not say whether it was before or after first heard of the case from Mrs. Churchill. She ran through house saying Mr. Borden is murdered. Mrs. Churchill, number 90, Second Street. 11 o'clock is the nearest I can fix the time. Returned from market, saw Miss Lizzie at the rear door. I thought she looked somewhat strange, asked her what was the matter. She replied, her father has been killed. Please come over. I immediately complied. When I reached her, I said, Oh, Lizzie, Lizzie, where is your mother? She said, I don't know. The relations between Lizzie and her stepmother were not very friendly, I so hear. But I have no personal knowledge of it. 
Yes, I have heard they do not at all times eat from the same table. Mrs. Churchill was at Hunter's Market, and from there went directly home, which would take her about five minutes. William Sullivan, a clerk at Hun Hudner's, places the time when she left the store at 11.05 or 11.10. Miss Mary Gallagher at McManum's saw Mr. Borden at the corner of Main and String Spring Streets, just turning up spring, with a small package in his hand at 10.15. She remembered the time, for she was just coming downtown and looked up at the city clock. Finally, we have somebody who has a legit reason for knowing exactly what time it was. But even then, after hearing about a traumatic incident that just happened, and having to think backwards, um, let's face it, you could be wrong. You could be like, yeah, I, I saw him walking through. I know I was at the spot. Maybe you saw him walking through before you got to that spot. Maybe you saw him walking through after you looked at that spot. Witness statements are always going to be sus, and you just kind of got to roll with it and see who is collaborating with who. And I don't mean getting their story straight. I mean, like, if I say I was here at this time and somebody else says, yes, I was there at that time, such as Mrs. Churchill at Hudner's Market. She says she was there. The clerk says, yeah, I saw her there. You know, that's innocent collaboration. Joseph Short Sleeves, number four, Dover Street, and James Mather, corner of Rock and Bedford Street, carpenters employed on a building of Mr. Borden's, set the time Mr. Borden left them between 1030 and 1045. He went towards Spring Street. Mrs. Dr. Bowen was sitting at the parlor window awaiting the return of my daughter. I concluded she was not coming, got up, went through the sitting room, looked at the clock, which indicated 10.55, went through the dining room into the next room for a piece of cloth of 10 yards, which I wished to measure and cut in two. I had not finished measuring when the doorbell rang violently. I went to the call and found Mr. Borden's work girl, who went to the doctor, who was out. Mr. Borden returned home and went to Mr. Borden's at 11.25. Mrs. Dr. Kelly left the house to go to the dentist, looked at the clock just before going out, 10.35, saw Mr. Borden coming around the northwest corner of the house, going towards the front door, saw him put a key in the door. He had a small package in his hand from the way was coming. I think he was at the side door first. The time when Mrs. Kelly left the house is also fixed by the work girl at 10.35. L.M. Gifford, number 38, Franklin Street. I know nothing personally the domestic relations of the Borden family, but I have heard much rumor to the effect that they did not get along very pleasantly. This is Perry Gifford. We do sewing for the Borden family. I have heard Lizzie say harsh things of her stepmother. She said she did not and would not dine at the same table. She also said her stepmother was a horrid old thing. She was very pronounced and outspoken when referring to Mrs. Borden. This occurred last April. Miss Ida Gray, number 27 Whipple Street. Last Friday evening, August 5th, while in the horse car, two ladies were talking of Lizzie Borden. One remarked that Lizzie said while referring to Mrs. Borden that she is was one of the kind that will never die. Who the ladies were, she did not know. All this from these three ladies was given very reluctantly and not until they were forced quite hard. And you can see why that would also be a problem with a witness statement, is try to coerce a statement. Harem Harrington. When the proprietor of this foul deed is found, it will be one of the household. I had a long talk with Lizzie yesterday, Thursday, the day of the murder, and I am not at all satisfied with statement or demeanor. She was too solicitous about his comfort and showed a side of character I never knew or even suspected her to possess. She helped him off with one coat and on with another and assisted him in an easy incline on the sofa and desired to place an afghan over him. 
and also to adjust the shutters so the light would not disturb his slumber. This is something she could not do, even if she felt, and no one who knows her could be made to believe it. She's very strong-willed and will fight for what she considers her rights. She went to the barn, where she stayed twenty minutes or half an hour looking for some lead from which to make sinkers for fishing lines, as she was going to Marion next week. He spoke about the Fairy Street estate being given to the girls and afterwards being returned. He spoke at some length about telling about the same story as was published in the News and Globe on Friday evening. Monday, August 8, 1892, in the afternoon, Dr. Bowen. Mrs. Churchill first told me of Mrs. Warden's death. Second interview of Mrs. Churchill. Mrs. Churchill, must I oblige? Am I obliged to tell you all? Well, if I must, I can't be blamed. Oh, I wish I had not to do this. I do not like to tell anything of my neighbor. But this is as it is. When I went over to answer to Lizzie's call, I asked, Oh, Lizzie, where is your father? In the sitting room, where were you? I was in the barn looking for a piece of iron. Where is your mother? She had a note to go and see someone who was sick. I don't know, but they killed her too. Has any man been to see your father this morning? Not that I know of. Dr. Bowen is not at home, and I must have a doctor. I think I heard Mrs. Borden come in. Will I go and get one or find someone who will? Yes, sir. Yes, I did so. When I returned, the first thing I recollect, Lizzie said is, Oh, I shall have to go to the cemetery myself. No, the undertaker will do that, was my reply. Then Dr. Bowen, George Allen, and Charles Sawyer came in. When Dr. Bowen had seen Mr. Borden, he asked me to come into the sitting room and see him, but I declined and said I would not. I saw him this morning, and he looked so nice. I do not care about seeing him now. The doctor then went out. Lizzie said, I think father must have an enemy, for we were all sick. When the doctor returned, he asked for a sheet. Bridget Sullivan, the work girl, was afraid to go upstairs alone, so I went with her. Lizzie said we would find the sheets in the dressing room, which is off of Mrs. Borden's room. I think we waited for a key to Mrs. Borden's room, and I think Dr. Bowen went into the sitting room to get it. If I am not mistaken, he first brought out a bunch, but the one wanted among was not among them. So we went in again and returned with a single key. We then went upstairs, and Bridget asked me if two would be enough. I said, I think so. One will cover a person. But we brought down two and gave them to Dr. Bowen. He covered Mr. Borden and then went out. Lizzie requested the doctor to send a telegram to her sister Emma, but not to tell her the facts, for the lady whom she is staying with is old and feeble and may be disturbed. Lizzie then said, I wish somebody would go upstairs to try to find Mrs. Borden. So Bridget and I started. I think she led the way. We went up the front stairs, but I only went far enough to clear my eyes above the second floor. The door to the spare room is on the north side of this hall when it was open. I turned my head to the left, and through this door I could see under the bed of this room. On the north side of the bed, on the floor, I saw what I thought to be a prostrate body. There was not much light in the room, so I could not distinguish clearly, but I knew the object was more than a mat. I felt certain it was Mrs. Borden. I then rushed downstairs and entered the dining room. I doubled myself and uttered an exclamation of fright. Miss Alice Russell asked, is there another? I said, yes, they killed her too, or something to that effect. I then informed Charles Sawyer of the fact. He made an explanation. Dr. Bowen then returned and I told him Mrs. Borden was upstairs in the spare room. He left the sitting room, I think, to go upstairs. I then thought I would go home and said, Lizzie, if there was anything you wish me to do, let me know later on. She said there would be plenty to do by and by. I felt like I needed to do a very dramatic retelling because she felt very drama queen. 
I mean, we have must, must I, am I obliged to tell you? Well, if I must, I can't be blamed. She was so waiting for someone to tell who in their discussion with the police says, I doubled over and exclaimed. I mean, maybe an old theater actress, but uh, most of us aren't quite that dramatic in our retellings. But hey, it sounds like she had fun in saying how she discovered the body. Miss Sarah Shawlick of Cook Street had clue. Janice Duckworth, number 43 John Street, told her that Annie Connolly, aged eight years, and Mammy Smith, aged 10 years, heard cries in Mr. Borden's house. And a few minutes later, a man came out the front door, wiping his coat and vest with a handkerchief. These children deny this, the oldest saying she was at her cousin's on the corner of 2nd and Rodman Street all that day. And the other girl was with her. It was simply child's talk. Um, children's testimony is also kind of difficult. That is why we have professionals who their whole job is just to suss out whether something is true or not from a child. And that's because children are very easily led astray. Some children are prone to flights of fancy. Some are too terrified to say what they saw. And some are under the influence of their parents. And it doesn't even necessarily mean small children. There have been cases where many dozens of teenagers have witnessed a shooting and their parents have pressured them, don't get involved so they remained mum until well into their 20s or later. So it wouldn't be surprising at all if their parents were like, yeah, kids, you didn't see anything. You guys were at the cousin's house. And the kids are like, yep, that's exactly what happened. My parents told me that's what happened. And that's what happened. We saw nothing. So it could be that this random Miss Sarah Shalik, um just made it up which would be weird in itself. Or that these two children, you know, maybe these two children really were at the cousin's house. Maybe they weren't. We will probably never know. Unless somebody discovers, you know, a letter in an old house during renovation. We're probably never going to know that answer. Thomas Walker, a tailor employed by John Carey, lived in a tenement of Mrs. Borden's on 4th Street. He was ordered out an R.S. Reed store took, for, took his furniture. He worked all day Thursday, so says Mr. Carey. Walker said he had no feeling against Mr. Borden. What trouble he had was caused by himself. He said he went on a drunk and could not pay his bills, so he had to vacate the tenement and return the furniture, which was purchased on the installment plan. Tuesday, August 9, 1892, P.H. Doherty went for Bridget and escorted her to court, went with Officer Perrin to the Flint to locate a Frenchman, but could not find him, then returned to the house with Bridget and remained until relieved by the night officer. Tuesday, 9, 1892, Harrington went with the marshal to summons Lizzie, returned to the station. When the inquest adjourned, remained in the courtroom until 5, 10 p.m. Peleg Brightman reported to having seen an ax covered with blood in a house over the river on Brayton Farm. Officer Medley and I took Mr. Brightman. We found the ax, which was owned by Joseph Sylvia. There was no blood on it at this time. Sylvia gave a full account of himself. There were two children there who had dirty dresses on, which were caked with blood. The mother explained this by saying they were very much subject to the nosebleed. And as the axe is always in the backyard, where there is a pile of wood, the blood from them might have stained the blade. The axe was old, dull, and much worn. In our judgment, it could not produce the wounds if it were used for this purpose. It could not be carried so far away over the river and by ponds, one of which was close by the house. 
when either of those places could afford such a secure hiding place. Okay, so I do agree that, yeah, there'd be no point in taking this ax to commit a murder then could bring it all the way back home. When you could just toss the ax into the river, into the pond, and it's gone forever. What is sus as hell is that you have two children with dirty dresses that are caked with blood. And the mother's like, yeah, you know, they get the nosebleed. And you know how it is. You got an ax in the backyard. You got kids that suffer from the nosebleed and they bleed all over the ax. We just wash the ax off. Do we wash the children off? No, we just wash the ax. Wednesday, August 10, 1892. Doherty and Harrington. A story was circulated that Lizzie tried to induce Bridget to leave the house by reminding her of a cheap sale of dress goods at F.E. Sargent's and offered her money to purchase one pattern after Bridget said she could not afford it. Bridget denies this, but says that Lizzie told her of the sale and she, Bridget, said, well, I'm going to have one. We then went to Mrs. George Whitehead on 4th Street. She said this property was owned in part by me and my mother. My mother wished to dispose of her interest. I could not purchase it and did not want to sell. So in order that I might keep my place, Mrs. Borden, my stepsister, bought the other interest. This the girls did not like, and they showed their feeling on the street by not recognizing me. Lizzie did not like Mrs. Borden. It seems that Lizzie is not the only one who did not like their stepmother. It seems like this was a very mutual, like neither of the girls liked their stepmother. But unfortunately, Lizzie was the one who was at home at the time of the murders. The reader in me is like, yep, her sister totally faked the whole thing, uh, snuck back in, murdered their parents, and then snuck back out, and no one would be the wiser. Unfortunately, her sister was also very recognizable in town as I'm getting the feeling that like everybody knew who they were. They didn't have the kind of face that blended in with the crowd and no one would notice. It just seems that Lizzie may be a bit more outgoing and strong-willed than her sister. So people have more strong opinions of her than of her sister. Engage Morris Daly, Carpenter, to go to the Borden house about one o'clock. Marshall, Mr. Seaver, and I, from there we took a marble slat from the west end of the dressing case, a piece of molding that capped the mop board and a piece of plaster, to which was adhered the wallpaper. Each of these articles had spots of blood on them. Mrs. C.J. Holmes then asked, do you want the bed spread in the pillow shams? The marshal replied, if you please. These articles were taken from the northwest room on the second floor where Mrs. Borden was found. A piece of wood was taken from the west casing of the door which leads from the dining to the sitting room where Mr. Borden was murdered. This piece of wood had a splatter of blood on it. There was also taken one pair of ladies' low tie shoes and one pair of ladies' black stockings. From the barn, we took one willow basket to containing two pieces of round lead pipe and a number of pieces of scrap sheet lead and one wooden box in which were pieces of round and sheet lead. The basket and contents were found upstairs and the box and its holdings downstairs. All were brought to the station house and locked in the store by Marshall Hillard and summoned Mrs. Churchill, Hiram C. Harrington, and Alan Egan to appear in court at four in the afternoon. So, did that have a date on it? Okay, that didn't have a date on it, um, but they are now collecting actual evidence. The one thing I don't like about these witness statements is that they seem kind of jumbled. And they're in, they appear to be in chronological order, but they're also kind of jumbled because of that. I know that doesn't make sense because you're like, of course we should put them in chronological order. But it kind of makes sense to put them in chronological order, but also to put them in by witnesses. And what I mean is like they interviewed Mrs. Churchill at least twice now, right? So you put in her first one and then you would put in like 
put in the first interview, then put in the second, third, fourth, however many interviews that she had. So that they're all kind of like condensed together. All this jumping around tends to get me like a little confused, especially when we have like, okay, I'm going to assume that because up here they have Wednesday, August 10th, 1892. And it was a statement compiled by Doherty and Harrington. And they're talking about the story with Bridget in the dress. And then the very next paragraph, they say, we then went to Mrs. George Whitehead, where she makes the statement about how she got, was able to keep her house. She was able to keep her house because her stepsister's husband helped her buy her interest in the portion of the house and that the girls didn't like it. And the section after that is talking about the carpenter and how they went to go collect the evidence. So I am assuming that they did not collect the evidence until August 10th. This episode is getting to be longer than I'd like. So I'm going to call it quits and resume with part two of this episode next time. My voice is obviously not the best right now after all this. So I'll come back with some hot water, maybe some nice tea, and we'll resume later. Happy hunting.